This video is about the evolution of North Korea's official ideology. From its origins in the 1945 to 1950 period, where we saw the implementation of a more traditional Marxist-Leninist model, imported largely from the Soviet Union, into an ideological canon that's much more uniquely North Korean. A key observation to be made in this video is that the official ideology of the DPRK state has necessarily evolved with the country's changing circumstances. And it's also evolved to suit the specific needs of each leader when they've come to power. There are a lot of images from official DPRK propaganda in this video. And I encourage you to closely examine the symbolism that's contained in each image. Everything in these images is designed to communicate ideological themes down to the smallest detail. So please pay attention to that. In this video, I'll explain the concept of ideology and its importance in authoritarian political systems. It has a role as an explanation for the state of the world. It has a role in producing legitimacy and emotional attachment to the leadership. Ideology also imagines a preferred order and a blueprint for action. And we'll look at the three different iterations of that blueprint for action, starting with Juche in the Kim Il-sung era, then looking at Songun politics during the reign of Kim Jong-il, and most recently, the Byung-jin line during the period of Kim Jong-un's leadership. Ideology is a concept with many different definitions and conceptualizations. But here I'm going to draw from the magisterial book, The North and South Korean Political Systems by Yang Song Chul. And he describes ideology as a symbolic tool of political power. So for Yang, this means ideology is a set of diagnoses of the past, analysis of the present, and prognosis of the desirable future polity, economy, and society. Within this definition, we can identify a number of functions that ideology performs, which are certainly pertinent to the North Korean case. First, the official state ideology provides an explanation of the current state of affairs, or that is, why the world is the way it is. Ideology seeks to establish the legitimacy of the ruling regime and the legitimacy of its exercise of power. And in so doing, it provides the ideas that explain why the rulers should be able to rule, and it cultivates an intense emotional attachment to the existing order among the wider population. Ideology provides an integrative function in promoting national unity and social solidarity. In so doing, the official ideology provides a guide to in-group members on appropriate behaviour. If you like, it's the framework for the rules of the game and for institutional cultures. And these are things that in-group members need to know in order to be participants and reinforcers of that ideology. Coming back to Yang Sung Chul's past, present and future thesis of ideology, I also want to highlight the practical application of ideology in the North Korean context. As a set of doctrines, beliefs, norms and symbols, it forms a conceptual basis for a political and social and economic system, as well as a blueprint for how that system should function. In so doing, official ideology imagines a utopian order and it proposes a method of political action to achieve this utopia. As that blueprint, it's a rationale for the institutional design of the system and a guide for policymakers within those institutions. Let's come back to ideology as an explanation for the state of the world. So official DPRK ideology presents a starkly clear explanation for North Korea's place in what it sees as a region that's inherently dangerous and threatening. So where does this come from? Well, an insular Korean nationalism developed during the Japanese occupation, and this was a nationalism that had elements of victimization and lacked self-confidence. American scholar Andrew Scoble called this a wounded ultranationalism, which expressed as both xenophobia 
as well as a deep-seated and dignified pride in being Korean. Australian academic Adrian Buzo called this an expression of a resentful nationalism which characteristically evinced a profound sense of injustice, an impotence and an inequality which had little faith that the world could ever be anything other than a threatening place. Now, the images in the slide that you see here, these are images of paintings from the Shinchon War Museum, which is in North Korea, about an hour south of Pyongyang. Now, Shinchon was the site of a quite a disturbing massacre during the Korean War. North Korea officially argues that it was US forces that were responsible for this massacre. And in these paintings, note the manic devil-like depiction of the American troops in these images and both the fear and the resolute defiance on the faces of the North Koreans, which speaks directly to this wounded nationalism. Now, just to, to touch on this massacre, while an atrocity certainly took place at Sinchon, there's no debate about that, historians from South Korea and the US have found that it was more likely to be, have been committed by South Korean troops rather than the Americans. Indeed, the colonial era is crucial to understanding the worldview of North Korean ideology and how this explains North Korea's understanding of its place in today's world. The resistance to Japanese aggression was a founding principle of the North Korean state, and it's one of the primary characteristics of Kim Il-sung in the collective memory of North Koreans. Indeed, this is what children in the DPRK have learned for decades, that their country was forged by Kim Il-sung through the blood of the anti-Japanese struggle. Japanese landlords are a common villain figure in many DPRK literary works and movies. This spirit of anti-imperial resistance is even enshrined in one of the preambles of the DPRK constitution, with other articles referring to the existence of the country as an antagonist to imperialism and colonialism. So this anti-imperialism, this is central to the core promise that the government makes to its people, that North Korea will never again have its sovereignty and independence violated by a foreign power. It's not a huge leap then to see how seamlessly the anti-Americanism of North Korean propaganda and its depiction of the United States as a great existential threat aligns with this view of the world that harks back to the Japanese occupation. North Korean propaganda blames almost all of the country's current problems on the United States, or in a related way to its running dog, South Korea. And you can read through the English language translations from Korean Central News Agency, which is the DPRK's external propaganda site, and read the wording of any article on any given day from KCNA, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. However, the most effective propaganda in any context is always based on a grain of truth, which is what makes it more convincing. So in this context, American bombings during the Korean War did flatten North Korea's cities. US troops do continue to be stationed in South Korea, and they do conduct annual war games that simulate an attack on the North. The US government is pivotal in maintaining the UN economic sanctions regime against the North. So the North Korean government is highly adept at weaving these things from reality in a certain way into the messaging it has to its people. Some analysts have argued that the centrality of the US as a great external enemy is so important to legitimizing the, Korea, the Kim regime that it might inevitably be impossible for North Korea to make peace with the US without its whole ideological system unraveling. The key element that attempts to cultivate emotional attachment to the government in North Korean propaganda has been the personality cult that's built around its first leader, Kim Il-sung. Kim evolved from the leader of the revolutionary clique in Manchuria into the hero leader of the nation, transforming himself from Kim Il-sung the man 
into Kim Il-sung, the legend and myth, the great leader, as he's referred to in official propaganda. Let's explore further this concept of cultivating a quasi-religious devotion to the leader. So in most dictatorships, whether they're right wing or left wing, the leadership usually attempts to create a cult of personality around its key figures. These personality cults attempt to establish the legitimate right of the dictator to rule and usually appeal to some kind of divine right to rule, similar to the absolutism of kings in pre-Enlightenment Europe. And if you think about it, there really aren't any other bases upon which a dictator can attempt to legitimise their position other than through brute force. But you can't do it through brute force alone over an extended period. So this is why the cult of personality is important. Total control is costly. It's much easier to maintain power when people want to be a part of that system. Even if when we're talking about people, we mean only an important segment of a larger population. Also, Kim Il-sung's charismatic persona was an important element to the personality cult. So it's no ac accident that most depictions of him show him smiling and waving, as you can see here. So as I mentioned, personality cults are not unique to North Korea. They were a common feature of Stalinist systems in communist countries around the world, which proliferated globally through the mid 20th century. The North Korean version, though, is not strictly a Soviet import, although that's where its origins are, but it also blends in elements of Confucianism and traditional Korean culture as well. So for those of you who don't know much about Confucianism, Confucianism is based around five core relationships, each of which has its own hierarchy and obligations. So these relationships are ruler over subject, father over son, husband over wife, older sibling over young, younger sibling, and friend to friend. So you can see that this framework of relationships already has a strong authoritarian flavor. So it's not a huge leap to apply this uh, in the context of this communist dictatorship. There's a lot of crossover. Now, the application of Confucianism in this context is important because Korea traditionally has a deep Confucian lineage. If we come back to the Australian academic Adrian Buzo, he's argued that the Kim personality cult substituted the family and kinship loyalties of traditional Korean Confucianism with political and state-centric allegiance, which positioned the leader as both the national father figure and the head of the communist political system. And you'll often see images of the leader as the wise, benevolent parent caring for his children, like in this photo here. This family emphasis helped the Kim Il-sung personality cult to grow beyond the ideological core of Stalinist communism. The cult of personality has many manifestations on the ground. So for one, each of the three leaders has conducted on-the-spot guidance visits to places all around the country, from workplaces to farms to community organisations, etc., where they dispense their wisdom to the people and give guidance. And this is something, again, that you see from other leadership cults around the communist world. Now, every time one of the leaders visits somewhere around the country, it's commemorated with a red plaque that has the date of the visit and which of the leaders attended. And this is called a revolutionary site where the leader has come to give on the spot guides. And you see these all around the country when you travel around these, these red plaques to see where one of the leaders has come to visit at some point in time. Each province and city also has a revolutionary museum that has artifacts from when one of the leaders has come to visit. Uh, and that can be anything from things called revolutionary trees, which are, are meant to have been magically carved with slogans uh, commemorating the leaders to a tennis ball that one of the leaders threw in a game with a kid or a cigarette packet uh, that had the cigarettes that they smoked in one of their visits. So I've seen these things in person. So 
all kinds of things from the interesting to the mundane are held in these revolutionary museums. There's also the grand monuments. So every major town and city has a monument of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il, like the one depicted here in Pyongyang. Among other, there's lots of different murals uh, and other statues that you find around the country. And you'll see some of my photos of these through the lecture presentations. There's also the collected written works of the three leaders, starting with the works of Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un also have published works, uh, which you can find distributed through the Pyongyang Foreign Languages Publishing House uh, to external audiences. So there's a whole body of thought associated with the leaders, which is a manifestation of this cult. So what all, all of these manifestations do is they cultivate the image of the Kims as indispensable to the nation. And indeed, as British geographer Peter Atkins has argued, even the whole grand architecture of the city of Pyongyang itself, along with the architecture of some of the other larger cities, explicitly speaks to the grandiosity and greatness of the leader and their projection of power. Attachment to the state and devotion to the leader is maintained in the North Korean political system by keeping the people in a permanent state of revolution. So think back to the immediate post-liberation period between 1945 and 1950, and the tectonic political and socioeconomic upheaval that was caused by the crumbling of the old colonial political order. So in the midst of that, with the implementation of this communist revolution, what we're seeing here is a very conscious attempt to remake North Korean society. And to do this involved the remaking of individuals through proletarianization. So let me explain. So to understand proletarianization, we have to come back to Karl Marx in the 19th century. So Marx predicted that the continued exploitation of the underclass in the capitalist world would, would create great resentment and that the proletarian class revolution against the bourgeoisie would eventually end up with a final struggle that would lead to the overthrow of capitalism. So thus in communist societies in the 20th century, the proletariat industrial working class was positioned as the vanguard of the communist revolution. So in all of these communist countries, the industrial working class was given a prioritized position and, but more importantly, was messaged as the vanguard in official propaganda. Uh, and indeed, the proletariat was the backbone of the support base for communist revolutions around the world. So if you look at this, the big picture on the slide here, this is a, a really big monument at Mansade in the middle of Pyongyang. And this depicts the workers and soldiers coming together for the revolution. And you see similar kinds of monuments to this in Moscow and Beijing and Hanoi. So what this does is it establishes very clear in-groups and very clear enemies. So in post-revolutionary communist states, anyone who was not seen as of the proletarian class were viewed as class enemies and class enemies needed to be purged as enemies of the revolution. So this is the ideological basis that underpinned North Korea's claim as the legitimate government of all Korea. This is the ideological basis that's used to justify the periodic purges from within the North Korean state hierarchy of individuals that the leadership doesn't like. And this is in the North Korean context, we see this embodied in the Songbun class system. We see it embodied in the activities of the Workers' Party of the Workers' Party of Korea and in the surveillance and punishment functions of the coercive institutions of the government. So with the in-group and the enemies established, the official ideology then signals to the people what they need to do to continue being part of this in-group. So this is clearly communicated through official media outlets, such as Korea Central TV and the newspaper Nodong Shinmun. And I encourage you to check out these at some stage through the website NK Pro, where you can access these. The ideology 
communicates norms of behaviour, and these include appropriate conduct in the workplace and appropriate conduct in party organisations. It includes knowledge of the thought of the leaders Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un. It includes rituals of homage to those leaders, along with other more mundane tasks of everyday life that have an ideological tint. So I recommend the Russian scholar Andrei Lankov, who's written a number of excellent books on this topic. North Korean ideology contains its own preferred order and blueprint for action. The imported ideological dogmas of Soviet communism that were used to establish North Korean ideology in the North Korean political system, these were reimagined into an ideological canon that was more uniquely North Korean. And this evolved into the ideology of Juche. So what is Juche? Well, Kim Il-sung saw Juche as the independent creative adaptation of Marxism-Leninism to the unique realities of Korea. He warned against the wholesale adoption of foreign movements without regard for the history and traditions and politics of Korea. He also warned against the dogmatic adherence to Marxism-Leninism as the only true path for the revolutionary movement. So the question is why? Why was Kim Il-sung so intent on evolving North Korea's official ideology away from its Marxist-Leninist roots. This is a, an interesting topic to explore. The term Juche is first recorded as being used in North Korean politics in 1955. Now, at this time, Kim Il-sung was facing down factional rivals within the DPRK, and he was also attempting to manoeuvre North Korea through the emerging Sino-Soviet split. Juche was also influenced by debates within the USSR about the direction of communist doctrine and practice after Stalin's death in 1953. Juche also had appeal for peoples in newly decolonized states and became a cultural export through the North Korean friendship associations that became established in many countries, as well as other organizations called Juche study groups. Uh, and indeed, Australia had its own iterations of both. In the picture here, you can see men of different nationalities holding up the Juche ideal. And that is illustrative of this uh, liberatory idea of independent action embodied in Juche for some people in newly decolonized states. Indeed, Juche is commonly translated to mean independence or self-reliance. However, it can be interpreted more deeply than this. Juche translates literally into English as main body, but it also means subject or subjectivity and master as opposed to slave. American historian Bruce Cummings suggests that Juche is more of a nativist, career-centric state of mind of putting career first in everything or dare I say, make North Korea great again. But for Kim Il-sung, economic and political independence were interrelated. So we can see in this quote from Kim here, where he says, in strengthening the independence of the country, it's essential to strengthen self-reliance in the economy along with political independence, and so on and so on and so on. This theme of economic and political independence has persevered throughout the history of the DPRK. And indeed, it remains embedded uh, in North Korean strategic thinking, particularly when we, th we think of Songun politics and we think of the Byongjin line later in uh, Kim Jong-un's reign. This economic and political independence theme is obviously there, as you'll see shortly. But let's consider some of these other interpretations of Juche. So there is a pitfall in adhering to a literal translation of Juche as self-reliance. So this traps one into thinking that Juche champions complete isolation. Now thinking of where North Korea is at today, like you could make some linking logic there, but that's not the case. In the Kim Il-sung era, when Juche was developed, the quest for self-sufficiency did not at all preclude international trade or the acceptance of aid. As Kim Il-sung once said, 
If you provide economic aid, we will accept it. But if you don't, we'll be okay nevertheless. This is the principle of self-sufficiency. So what this shows, though, is that North Korea had long-standing economic relationships with the USSR and other countries around the communist bloc. That hard isolation that we're more familiar with now, that's a consequence of the Soviet collapse in 1991. It wasn't the original state of affairs earlier in North Korea's history. But what this signals, though, is that Juche has incorporated layers of meaning to adapt it to the changing needs of the ruling elite because circumstances have changed significantly for North Korea over time. So for this reason, some scholars have suggested that Juche cannot be thought of as a profound or cohesive set of ideas because it has been so malleable. Is Juche so changeable as to be completely meaningless? You know, this is an interesting question to ponder. So let's pick up the baton now on the theme of ideological change across the history of the DPRK. So Kim Il-sung's cult of personality was inherited by his son, Kim Jong-il, also referred to in official messaging as the dear leader. And the personality cult had to be passed on because it legitimized the dynastic succession through the Kim family. So again, Ideology, this link between ideology and legitimacy is really important. Now, prior to becoming the leader, Kim Jong-il was groomed for power from around 1970. And he was actually quite pivotal in the exposition of Juche. So in his official roles, he oversaw the development of Juche thought and was highly influential in its development and implementation. And in his official roles before becoming leader, he was heavily involved in the DPRK's propaganda machine. And his love of filmmaking is a prime example of this. Ideological symbolism was an important part of this use of ideology as the legitimizing device, which was intended to establish Kim Jong-il's divine right to rule and to his succession as leader. So, for example, let's look at some of the ideological symbolism in the photographs depicted here. There's two photos there that show Kim Jong-il standing next to Mount Pektu or Pektu San or Changbai Shan, as it's known in China, which is a big volcanic crater lake on the borders, right on the border between North Korea and China. And Pektu San is a pivotal location in the mytholo mythology of the origins of the Korean nation. So it's an important cultural site for all Koreans, not just North Korea. Now, official propaganda says that Kim Jong-il was born on the slopes of Mount Pektu. Really, he was born in Khabarovsk in, uh, in Siberia in the USSR. But the propaganda suggests that he was born there to link him to this larger origin mythology of the Korean nation. And this is how he gets incorporated into the personality cult of his father. We see Kim Jong-il statues erected across the country next to all of the Kim Il-sung statues. And that attempts to establish Kim Jong-il's legitimacy as the heir to Kim Il-sung's dynasty. And remember, he's the successor leader. He's not the regime founder. So he can't claim to be a guerrilla leader against the Japanese in Manchuria. He needs his own legitimizing symbols. And that's where all of this stuff comes in. Also note the flowers in the bottom right hand image. This is the Kim Jong Ilya, which is a specially cultivated hybrid begonia flower. Uh, and again, you'll see this particular flower depicted a lot in images of Kim Jong Il. Kim Jong-il assumed the leadership in very challenging circumstances. So he came to power in 1994 after his father's death. Now, what's happening at this time? Well, the Soviet Union has just collapsed and North Korea loses all of its key allies and economic network from across the communist bloc. He's inheriting what's essentially a failing state. So this is when the famine of the arduous March period is kicking off. And then he gets a series of environmental shocks to the country in successive years of catastrophic floods, 
and in a drought. So these environmental shocks make the famine worse. Now you can see these challenges communicated in the mural depicted here. Note how the struggling people are looking up to Kim Jong-il in this image. So they're clearly in distress. Note how Kim is hugging the children that are right next to him. Again, that consistent theme of the father figure in the leadership cult. Note also how Kim is positioned in relationship to the statue of his father behind him. So again, clearly communicating Kim Jong-il as the heir to Kim Il-sung's legacy. So in these difficult circumstances, Kim Jong-il cultivates a close relationship with the Korean People's Army to solidify his rule through a strategy called Songun politics or military first politics. Under Songun politics, Kim gave the military priority access to the scarce resources of the state and made the KPA the vanguard of North Korea's economic recovery strategy. So this invested significant power with the KPA, gave the KPA control over entire sectors of the economy and entire production chains. And it also gave the KPA a gatekeeper role in the distribution of food and consumables to the rest of the population, which allowed the military to skim profits. For Kim Jong-il, Songun politics was an act of political triage through which he bought off the military for their support during the crisis period at the beginning of his reign. Songun maintained the veneer of Juche self-reliance for the country, but many people missed out. Approximately 600,000 people perished during this time, with whole segments of the population effectively left to fend for themselves. However, from the perspective of leadership preservation, Songun was, was a successful pivot for Kim Jong-il and a key reason why the North Korean government did not completely collapse during the arduous march. Kim Jong-il passed away after a long illness in December 2011, and the succession passed to his third son, the respected leader Kim Jong-un and he's also called Marshal Kim Jong-un in official propaganda. Kim Jong-un was the youngest of his father's three sons, and he came to power at a very young age, only in his late 20s. He'd been educated in Switzerland, and so he was very knowledgeable about the world outside the DPRK, as evidenced by his fondness for NBA basketball. Unlike his father, who was apprenticed for the leadership for over 20 years, Kim Jong-un only began the grooming process in 2009 when Kim Jong-il became sick. This was a potential risk for the leadership transition. So in authoritarian political systems generally, incoming leaders tend to do best when they've got time to get experience and to cultivate relationships with key figures across the institutions of the state or you know, cultivate a network of support. Kim had a relatively short period of time to do this, so there was some uncertainty about the leadership transition when he first came to power. It is suggested that Kim Jong-un is more ruthless than his father, and the number of officials that have been purged during his reign appear to back this up, including the murders of his uncle, Chang song Tech and his older brother, Kim Jong-nam. Ideological messaging during Kim Jong-un's reign has become more sophisticated than what we saw previously. The personality cult has been de-emphasized to a degree, and it's much less evident than during previous eras. Now, having said that, Kim Jong-un does have a strong resemblance to his grandfather, Kim Il-sung, when Kim Il-sung was a young man. And this resemblance was often emphasized in commu uh, uh, official communications, particularly during the early years of Kim Jong-un's leadership. Kim Jong-un has cultivated a more contemporary flair in how he's presented, which we've seen at various stages through his association with former NBA star Dennis Rodman, through his patronage of the Morinbong band, and through his marriage to Ri Sol-ju, who was a well-known popular singer in North Korea. During this time, the North Korean government's official media messaging to the outside world has also become more sophisticated, 
and has made better use of online multimedia and has communicated in less bombastic language. And that doesn't mean they've eliminated the bombastic language. It just means it's they've put a lid on it a little bit. The personality cult hasn't completely disappeared, though. This picture of Kim Jong-un with kids and families is very similar to the one we saw earlier of Kim Il-sung, depicting Confucian filial piety to the leader as the father of the nation. The major ideological innovation of Kim Jong-un's reign has been the Byung-jin line, which is about mobilising the resources of the North Korean state for simultaneous nuclear weapons development and economic modernization. The logic of the Byung-jin line is that a mature nuclear weapons capability will provide a security umbrella under which economic reforms can begin to be rolled out, free of external interference. This economic modernization program has included what Kati Zellweger has described as the five M's, markets, mobiles, money, motor cars, and the middle class. Also integral to this program was the development of special economic zones to attract foreign capital and technology. And the map on the slide here illustrates the site of North Korea's special economic zones. Some of the funding for this program also came through a surge in mineral exports, predominantly facilitated through joint venture projects with Chinese firms. And I'll have more to say about this in the Evolution of the North Korean Economy video. Nonetheless, it's the nuclear weapons program that's central to the Byungjin vision. It demonstrates to the North Korean people the government's commitment to anti-imperialism and national self-reliance. It demonstrates the technological and scientific achievements of the North Korean state. And in short, it's been the legitimizing idea of Kim Jong-un's leadership. So what can we learn from this story that's more generally applicable? Well, all ideologies perform the functions that I identified at the beginning of this video. If you know where to look, you can see it in our own society and in our own behaviours and beliefs. Different ideologies perform these functions, though, in different ways, depending on the context. Ideology isn't necessarily bad. Indeed, it's the glue that holds a political system together by providing it with legitimacy. Legitimacy is especially critical for the longevity of authoritarian politi political systems, but it's just as true of liberal democracies like Australia. So if ideology is the language of political contestation, and if all human activities are inherently political, then it's impossible not to be immersed in ideology wherever you happen to be. As you prepare for your assessment task on this material, please keep these key points in mind. Uh -huh.